RLR taking on a case. Um, as always, we need a volunteer to present a case. If you haven't presented a case, um, you know, take the risk and volunteer. It's a lot of fun. It's very laid back. Um, if you have presented a case in the past and want to present, please let us know. Communicate through the chat. As we're waiting for a case volunteer, um, I'm going to ask both Mukond and Yasmin to unmute themselves and tell us what they'll be doing today and and how um, how life is going. Oh, <laughs> do you want to go first, Mukund? No, go for it. Thank you, friend. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine. I am from Mexico. I'm a medical graduate. Right now, I'm living in San Antonio and I'm preparing for my step one. Everything is going as good as it can. It's a loaded question, isn't it, Yasmin? <laughs> Thank you. And you noted as a facilitator, you should probably give the mic to one person rather than throw it in the middle so no one knows who should speak first. But it's a little bit of a psychological experiment that I'm conducting here. Um, and you both have passed with flying colors. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Mukun. I'm a second year medical student in San Francisco. Um, life is going pretty well. I'm enjoying my second year. Everything is really interesting. Today, I have a pelvic anatomy practical exam in the afternoon, so wish me luck. What I, I, I am wishing you luck, and I'm inviting our audience to wish you luck. And what I admire most about Mukund is that he's starting at such an early stage in his career of being exposed to CP solvers. So the first or second year medical students, you are the future, and we're thrilled to have you be part of this movement of diagnostic reasoning. Now, do we have a case volunteer? And at this point, um, I am gonna mute myself until someone volunteers. And once we get someone volunteered, we have to make a, a huge plug for an event we have this weekend, but let's hold off on that for just one more minute as we wait for a, uh, a person to volunteer to present a case. I have to say hi to Dan Minter. I knew I wasn't going to unmute, but I haven't seen Dan in so long. And for those of you who don't know Dan, he was actually one of the first members of CP Solvers. It was me, Robbie, Charmin, Arsalan, and then Dan Minter. Dan, can you just unmute yourself and tell me how you are? Dan is, uh, he might already be an ID attending and time has flown, <laughs> but he definitely is ID extraordinaire. Um, Dan, how's it going? I missed you, Reza. How are you doing, man? I'm just emerging from this like tunnel that is first year fellowship and finally getting to the point where I could like have a little bit of ownership over my schedule. But <laughs> it's been great. Yeah, I learned a ton. I'm like still, you know, physically exhausted from the year, but it was it was like honestly one of the most fun, fun clinical years I've ever had in my life. Wow, that is incredible to hear. And and what I love so much, Dan, about your um career trajectory is that you have a love for clinical reasoning and now you have this subspecialty skill of ID and to marry those two um, I think is going to be something extraordinary for the field of ID. Uh, with that being said we do have a case volunteer who sent me a private message and it's no one other than the other R. If you thought two R's was too many <laughs> we have a third R in Ravi um, Ravi, before you present your case, I was hoping that Rafa can unmute himself and share an event that we have planned um, this weekend. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rafael, and I'm a medical graduate from Brazil. So we're from the CP Service organizing um, a, a personal statement session tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time with Dr. Alisa Gallo. She's the internal medicine 
Associate Program Direct from Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She was kind enough to accept our invitation and she'll be tackling the do's and the don'ts and the end we'll open the chat for questions. So please come in tomorrow. Uh, it's a privilege to have you there. Thank you, Razem. And look at that, another R, four R's. What is going on, CP solvers? Um, that being said, let's give the mic to Ravi. And Ravi, how are you, my friend? Um, I'm doing well. How are you? I, I'm doing really well. I, I I did want to just go on record to apologize. I didn't get a chance to see you in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, I came down with COVID. Although by Dan Minter's definition, it's mild because I didn't have hypoxemia or pulmonary involvement. It was anything but mild. This thing knocked the thing out of me. <laughs> but I'm back drinking my coffee. I can't smell the coffee. I can't taste it. <laughs> but I can feel the effect of the caffeine. <laughs> yeah, Dad, I can definitely relate to that. I had it over Christmas. And uh, yeah, it really knocked me off my off my feet. Man, did the whole family get it, Ravi? Or were you yep. with the, yep. yeah. the, the the kids were fine after a day, but it was just me and my wife were down for five days and felt terrible. Yeah, my, my partner was visiting and I live in a 700 square foot subsidized housing by UCLA, but it's hard to afford housing here in Los Angeles. There's no way I was going to avoid it because Liz got it on her trip to, to LA. Because I, I guess like with all the lax rules in flying these days, it's probably going to be much more, um, you know, travel acquired. With that being said, let's get the case going. Let's have some fun. You got the whiteboard. Okay, so for today's case, we have a 50-year-old male with a history of diabetes, hypertension and hyperlipidemia and hypothyroidism, recently admitted to a neighboring hospital for an MVA and now comes in with right shoulder pain and chest pain since he's been discharged about a week ago. And I'll stop at that other one. Uh, very helpful. And just um, one quick clarification question, Ravi. Was it um, hyper or hypothyroidism? Hypothyroidism. Hypo with an O. Yeah, correct? low thyroid. Low thyroid. Um, the reason I ask that, not that this is probably related to the current presentation, is once you have one endocrine gland down, you're at risk for other endocrinopathies. And here we see a patient with diabetes, hypothyroidism. It just reflexively made me think about autoimmune polyglandular syndrome. Um, so I just am tracking that, not that it's relevant to how I'm analyzing the foreground data. So this is a patient who was admitted for a um, motor vehicle accident. And so basically the admission was some form of trauma. And if you put on your ED hat, when you're caring for a patient who comes after a trauma, first and foremost, you want to rule out fractures, dissections, or ruptures of organs. And it all depends on the severity of the trauma sustained by the patient. So during that initial hospitalization, there's no doubt that those ED clinicians who are very good at dealing with trauma, didn't obtain the appropriate imaging to rule out um, you know, traumatic uh, pathologies, such as bone fractures. Then this patient is discharged and presumably didn't have shoulder pain and chest pain on the day of discharge from the first um, hospitalization or presentation. So, we have to keep in mind that there was some trauma, what kind of tests and studies were done. And now we have to analyze the foreground without that background of trauma, because you don't want to be too biased, though you know it may be related to the current presentation. So when you have shoulder pain and chest pain as a chief concern, which one should your mind tackle and why? Maybe you can answer that question in the chat. Uh, when I see these two concerns. Um, of course, I'll try to link the two together, but my mind is focused on the chest pain because um, we know causes of chest pain can be life-threatening. And literally, I will go through our four plus two plus two uh, diagnostic approach to chest pain. Woo! <laughs> 
You got it right. <laughs> there he is. There's the, the person we've been chatting about for the last 30 minutes. How are you, Robbie? By the way, I have this same Nike shirt that you have. I think it just reinforces the idea that about 35% of people on Twitter think we're twins. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's pick it up. Oh, man. I, I'll take that any day, especially if it's physical, uh, identical twins. Look at that beautiful hair. Anyways. Um, back to the chest pain. So when, when you're analyzing chest pain, you're going to ask the questions, does this patient have ACS? Does this patient have pulmonary embolism? Could there be an aortic dissection? And the way you're going to approach the chest pain is going to be through um, an electrocardiogram as your first branch point and probably a troponin. But this is more than just chest pain. This is chest pain and shoulder pain. And the question is, do you have pain in the chest that's radiating to the shoulder? For example, a myocardial infarction? Or could you actually have shoulder pain and it's being you know, um, thought of as simultaneous chest pain by the patient? And when you approach shoulder pain, the question becomes, are you dealing with a problem within the shoulder? Um, and the way to assess that is on physical exam. If there's tenderness, if movement exacerbates the pain, then you can start thinking about anatomical problems, whether it's a tendon, whether it's a bone that might be occurring in the shoulder. I think that's less likely because it would be hard to have a rotator cuff tendonitis that's manifesting as chest pain that prompts the patient to come to the hospital. So already I'm thinking this shoulder pain is probably some form of referred pain from the thoracic cavity. And we talked about some stuff like myocardial infarction, PE, dissection, but it could really be anything. So I think when we have these two concerns, my focus initially is on the, the thoracic cavity, uh, but the exam will be quite elucidating to what might be happening in the shoulder. Let me give the mic back to Ravi to give us more data uh, because we'll need more to be a little more focused in our thinking. Okay, okay, great, great job. Yeah, as um, I'm just presenting from my phone, so apologize uh, if it's not prepared. But um, so the patient, as you, as you get more history and you see the patient in the emergency room, apparently during his past hospitalization, he had fractures um, of ribs, several ribs, and also a delayed hemothorax, which was addressed with IR embolization of a bleeding intercostal artery. And uh, at that time, he also had a chest tube placement. So that all subsequently resolved and he was discharged. But prior to discharge, he had complained to uh, the team that he was developing now pain in the right shoulder and also the right side of the chest. And uh, as throughout the week, the pain continued and he tried to address it with Motrin and other anti-inflammatories, it wasn't resolving and then he noticed a subsequent limitation in the movement of, of the of the elbow, I mean, sorry, of the shoulder. So he was trying to lift the elbow up and he had to stop there just because the the, the pain was just immense, uh, 20 out of 10 pain, and he just couldn't move the, the shoulder upwards. Um, he also reported prior to, to discharge some shakes, which the team addressed probably due to just part of his whole uh, presentation as well. Elaborating on the past medical history, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and um, hyperlipidemia. Um, past surgical history was just the recent uh, chest tube insertion. And um, review of systems was the shakes. And then he was having sweats. He was sweating quite profusely. Now, he is um, slightly obese and he does have, um, I guess, he, he, he does uh, sleep with the fan on. Even if it's winter, he does feel warm all the time. But he was noticing even more uh, of these sweats. And um, I'll stop right there if, this, if you want to discuss this, Alequan. Ravi, I think um, this case kind of illustrates um, what Reza was saying. And I think what the chat is saying is just how powerful um, the exam is. And it, it's I, I say that recognizing that you haven't given us the exam, but you've provided us the patient reports of what we would do on exam, and that's so powerful. And I think it just really it reinforces the idea that there is something in the shoulder itself, 
um, as evidenced by the pain that the patient has with moving it. And um, it, it really puts into light these sort of emergent causes of um, intra joint uh, shoulder issues. So I think while there are many things that are possible, the most probable scenario with a right shoulder pain in which the shoulder hurts when you move is a rotator cuff injury. That's certainly the most probable. However, there's a big red flag and that big red flag is rotator cuff injuries are not usually this painful. They certainly can be, but I think you have to step back and make sure that's nothing else. So for me, I'd be thinking, oh, I'm worried about this being involving the shoulder joint. And what, what could those things be? You're, you can have a um, you can have a schema organized in many ways, but one practical way is to ask yourself what would show up on your next step, which is an x-ray, and what wouldn't show up. And the simple things that would show up on an x-ray are a fracture that was missed or not recognized, a tumor that was missed or not recognized, and the things that wouldn't show up on the x-ray would be things like septic arthritis or crystalline arthritis. And he has reasons to have most of those things. You can easily imagine why he might have a fracture that was missed or not recognized. And in the setting of procedures and lines and IVs and whatnot, could he have a septic process? Or in the, um, with the manifestation of trauma um, and his risk factors for crystalline diseases, his diabetes um, and his obesity, could he have gout or pseudo gout uh, in that shoulder? So I think that's what I'd be thinking about is what's the shoulder x-ray show? And if it's negative, is there evidence of an effusion in the shoulder that needs to be addressed or tapped? Um, but that's just the shoulder stuff. I'm curious what Prof. Brad is, makes of everything else, including the shoulder. Um, that, that it's like such an exciting case, uh, Robbie. It's exciting because we have features in this case that go beyond the shoulder. And the question becomes, are these extra shoulder manifestations and to be specific, talking about the shakes, talking about the sweats, are they related to what's happening in the shoulder or is it a separate process altogether? And quite frankly, I think you have to approach it as a separate process altogether. We recently had a VMR where Mohit Shah presented a case of Gurpreet Dhaliwal and that patient had pus coming out of their ear. So they had otitis externa, um, malignant otitis externa, but they also were given cefepime and then later developed uh, neurotoxicity from cefepime. So here, honestly, my instinct is that this is separate from what's happening in the shoulder. I think the shoulder, as Robbie mentioned, is probably an anatomical um, pathology leading to that discomfort. But now we get the exciting part of interpreting shakes and sweats. So sweats, it's easy. It sweats. There's no DDX for that. The patient is experiencing wetness. But I bet you Robbie would say there's mimickers, like someone just came out of a swimming pool. Someone just came out of a jacuzzi. You can, once you roll out those mimickers, you're dealing with sweats. And sweats, they make you think of sympathetic toxicity. And so when you first analyze the sweats, you ask the question, can sympathetic toxicity also lead to shakes? And the answer is, of course they can. The interesting thing about sweating is that although it's uh, increased sympathetic tone, I believe the final neurotransmitter is acetylcholine at the, um, at the neuro, neuro level. Um, so why do people have sympathetic toxicity? Well, it could be withdrawal from a medication um, or withdrawal from a toxin. And many of us are familiar with withdraw withdrawal from um, alcohol, how these patients have tachycardia, diaphoresis, can develop you know, confusion, psychosis, et cetera. So it's gonna be really important to review this patient's social history and health-related behaviors and medications. Because either one medication being on too much, for example, this patient has hypothyroidism. How about if they're mistakenly taking too much thyroid hormone? Could that result in diaphoresis and a tremor? Of course it can. Um, what if this patient drinks a lot of alcohol and all of a sudden, because they're feeling terrible from all the pain, they decide to stop drinking and now they're in a withdrawal state. So we're going to need much more uh, information there. And this patient has diabetes. 
What if the patient inadvertently took too much insulin and now is hypoglycemic and is having neuroglycopenic symptoms of hypoglycemia? So you can see how I'm using clues from this patient's history to try to make progress on the diaphoresis and the shakes. But in my mind right now, that is in a separate bucket than what's happening in the shoulder. It is possible that the patient is having such severe pain from the shoulder that it's causing them to have sweats, it's causing them to become tremulous. And we've seen this in extreme forms of pain. So that's another way you can link everything together. But before we go on, because I think this is so unique, Robbie, anything else to layer on that, that thinking? Not a zero. That's what I like to hear. All right, Robbie. <laughs> Oh, Reza, that inference was was uh, incredible. So there is actually a history in the social history um, of alcoholism. Um, so the patient has been working at home in his home office, kind of depressed, stressed, and recently has been drinking a lot more. So I just want to add it that. But one other layer I forgot to mention was during the week before presentation, he had gone to his primary care physician because of this. And he also was having nausea along with this shoulder pain. And the, uh, his physician then prescribed him uh, a medrol dose pack with, with tapering over that week. Uh, initially, there was some improvement, but then uh, the pain gradually ramped up again. Uh, do you want me to stop there before I go into the physical exam? Robbie, what do you, what do you want, Robbie? No, I, I just say that I just share my reflex, which is the nausea in the face of shoulder pain is extremely unusual um, and maybe proportional to the pain, but it may start to, uh, um, uh, yeah, basically, I think you would start to wonder, should you start to think about abdominal causes of shoulder pain? Because nausea often refers to the abdomen, but that has to be tempered with the fact that those causes don't usually cause shoulder pain worsening with movement of the shoulder. So that's where the nausea took me. It made me wonder, does this person have gallbladder or liver issues? But then I was like, wait, no, hold on. That doesn't make sense with the fact that it's so much worse when he moves the shoulder. But I think the key piece of data is that this patient has gotten uh, um, steroids now. And if you weren't thinking um, infectious arthritis before, you probably have to think about it now. And if you were thinking crystalline arthritis before, you have to probably temper that enthusiasm now because the steroids might quell that. Um, but yeah, nausea with shoulder pain, very, very unusual. Okay. Continuing on um, with the medicines, uh, patient takes alprazolam, amlodipine, atorvastatin, clonazepam, jardiance, glipizide, and um, Lantus insulin, as well as levothyroxine. Then moving on to the vital signs. Temperature 37.7, heart rate 88, respiratory rate 18, blood pressure 148 over 82, examination so quite uncomfortable in bed because of the the shoulder pain radiating down to the chest rest of the exam pretty much unremarkable except um there is some erythema slight erythema over the right shoulder there's also warmth when comparison to the um the other shoulder and a little swelling over the anterior right shoulder with limited range of motion and tenderness when when palpated. And um, I'll, I'll move on to the labs. The white count is 19.77, hemoglobin 10.7, platelets 599, Sodium 130, potassium 4.8, 
bicarb 27.5. BUN 21 and creatinine 1.23. Baseline is about 1. Glucose 207. And the rest of the chemistry is, is normal. So liver tests are normal. And I'll stop right there. Troponin, I'll add in as well, was normal. And, and Ravi, um, do you have a diff on that <clears throat> leukocytosis? And by chance, do you have a VBG or? Um, I don't have a VBG, but I, the diff I remember was primarily neutrophilic. Neutrophilic. Okay, yeah. very good. All right. Um, maybe what I can do is tackle the exam and leave the labs uh, for Robbie to, to comment on, though I am going to be borrowing the white blood cell count from the labs and leave the rest for Robbie to comment on. Um, so folks, if I can teach you one thing during this session, is an approach to a joint pain, approach to joint pain. And when you're evaluating a swollen joint, what your mind should do is make the leap from arthralgia, which is just pain, nonspecific pain of a joint, to arthritis. You should make that leap. And, and of course, there's a differential diagnosis and mimickers, but here my mind is making the leap to monoarticular arthritis for good reasons. For reasons that the shoulder is swollen, it's erythematous. Um, these are all findings consistent with inflammation. I do want to make that leap and I am making it, but there are diagnoses that we must exclude before just focusing on monoarticular arthritis. And as that ED provider, when someone comes in with shoulder pain, your job is to rule out fracture and make sure there isn't a septic joint or a crystalline process within the joint. And so this patient needs imaging. They need an x-ray, but you have to be cautious, folks, because 5% of x-rays may miss fractures. I recently on service had a patient who had a bilateral knee pain. They couldn't bear weight. And we got an x-ray. There was no fracture. And for some reason, I told the team, look, let's just get an MRI. Something just doesn't feel right because the patient can't bear weight. And the MRI showed bilateral patellar fractures. And I learned from that um, process, just similar to a chest x-ray and pneumonia, how not all chest x-rays capture a consolidation. The CT scan is much better at viewing the parenchyma. The same thing applies to the joint. So this is someone I might actually skip an x-ray knowing the cost of CT scan, knowing the radiation of CT scan because of what Robbie said, the severity of pain. And now because of what Robbie is showing us, which is, findings consistent with swelling. So I would want a CT scan to rule out fracture or some kind of process in someone who recently had an MVA, but I would also be concerned about a septic joint. There's a great article in the JAMA Clinical Rational Exam Series, which literally is titled, does the adult patient with joint pain have septic arthritis? Something like that. If you can find it, please include it in the chat for the audience. But they looked at three parameters for the septic joint, range of motion, fever, and leukocytosis. Here, what's really concerning is this impaired range of motion for an intraarticular inflammatory process and the leukocytosis. So in order of steps, I would get a CT scan. If that shows no fracture, then I'm going towards an arthrocentesis um, if there's fluid there to assess for crystalline disease or infectious arthritis. Um, but that's all I have for the exam, Robbie. Oh, that's absolutely superb. You know, I think that you really simplified it so much for us by walking us through, like, this is inflammatory shoulder pain. Make sure you're not missing a fracture. And then um, if that's negative, think about crystal or, or septic arthritis, excuse me. And yeah, I think, I don't know if, um, if the labs do anything but reinforce that notion. And I would say that, um, I would say, uh, 
I would just comment on on how much progress we've made since the history. Because just about 20 minutes ago, we were like, oh, you know what? I'm really sure where the problem is. Is it in the chest or is it in the shoulder? And I think it's become abundantly clear that the crux of this case is what is happening in that shoulder. And you can see how that's so largely driven by the exam. And that tends to be the case with all shoulder issues is you really, really want to figure out what is deviating you from the base rate that this is 95%, this is rotator cuff disease. And just to outline that, it's the fact that the patient has an effusion, that's very unusual, and the patient has a neutrophilic leukocytosis, very, very unusual. So I think what's the one way we could be fooled? The one way we could be fooled if this is an aggressive crystalline disease. Um, and there is one very aggressive crystalline disease that usually affects the shoulder, and that's called basic calcium phosphate crystalline disease, or, um, or um, hydroxyapatite. The reason to have that on your list is because it is basically the only cause of a hemorrhagic shoulder effusion, where it's actually mostly blood. Those crystals are so aggressive that they destroy the shoulder, cause evaporation of the shoulder and loss of the shoulder joint, along with um, hemorrhage. Now, why do I say that now? I say that now because I think that a patient's tap is in the future. And what I think we're expecting is an inflammatory effusion full of leukocytes. And the question will be, is it more septic or crystalline? But in this case, if you get a hemorrhagic shoulder effusion, I would not stop at saying, oh, this is probably from the trauma that happened a week ago. In a patient with a hemorrhagic shoulder effusion and signs of inflammation, the rare possibility of calcium hydroxyapatite or BCP, basic calcium phosphate, needs to be entertained. And that's a hard thing to entertain because it requires very special staining for that crystal. So there's many pitfalls in this case, including anchoring too much on benign causes of shoulder pain and not tapping the shoulder. And even when you tap the shoulder, not uh, don't minimize the... Uh, uh, the possibility of a, a hemor hemorrhagic effusion signifying non-traumatic causes. So it's, it's very murky, but I think like Prof. Rez suggested, a tap is going to be key in this case. All right, Ravi, Mike, to you. Yeah, I'm just going to put out a question to you that was kind of discolored in this whole, um, this presentation was the introduction of a medrol dose pack. And we looked at this white count now, giving you this tremendously elevated white count. How does that fit in with now, now your reasoning. Is this white count significant? Is it made murky by this medrol dose pack? It is significantly elevated, but. Robbie, I think you're spot on. Thank, thank you for making that astute teaching point for, for ourselves and the audience, because we know um, steroids can cause and cause demargination of mature neutrophils from the endothelium. So it's not unusual for someone to be exposed to steroids and then have a, a neutrophilia, specifically a neutrophilia, very similar to this patient. I think what I would do, to be honest, when I'm like thinking through a case like this, because that joint is red and because my mind has made the leap to monoarticular arthritis, because I have difficulty ranging it, my pretest is, is quite high for an inflammatory arthritis if there's no fracture that it doesn't dissuade me in um, you know, thinking about septic joint and, to, and being aggressive uh, for both empiric treatment and, empir and, and diagnostics for possible um, septic joint, because there's just too much at stake that if we miss a septic joint, that can lead to uh, serious ramifications for that patient in terms of functionality and, and mobility. So it, to use a term that Robbie used, it doesn't quell my um, desire to, <laughs> to look. And another term that right, it doesn't temper, use temper and quell in the same sentence. It doesn't temper or quell my desire, uh, though it's an alternative, very feasible explanation of a neutrophilia. And I guess the lack of response to steroids, Robbie, does that uh, make the, the thought of crystalline disease less significant? Yeah, Ravi, you know, I love, by the way, I love this idea of uh, this, like, um, querying from the case presenter, because I think it, it's probably what's happening in real life as we all kind of like pause and ask each other questions. And I think that the very assumption that anti-inflammatory therapy should quell all inflammation is a reasonable one, but we all have been in, ca in cases where you need more anti-inflammatory therapy. So, um, 
I think that the presence of steroids just complicates the picture and you have, it doesn't change any of the possibilities. It just complicates your analysis. There have been many cases of gout, pseudo gout and others that needed more than just steroids, including all the way up to anakinra. Um, but the, what the introduction of steroids does is it further prioritizes the need to rule out an infection, but doesn't eliminate um, the possibility of crystalline disease. So if you're, if you're saying, what is the outcome of this case a hundred times over, when you introduce steroids, I think 90, 90, um, 90% it's infection and 10% it's crystalline. Before steroids, it might've been 50-50. So none of them are gone. It's just that I think that the introduction of steroids augments infection and reduces crystalline. Um, and I'll just say the words temper and quell just to be complete. You know, they require to finish it, all sentences now. Oh, that, that's a really powerful point that uh, not just steroids will quell this, but I recently had a patient with CPBD who rebounded and needed colchicine on top of another steroid dose. So you're absolutely right about that. You think steroids will take care of everything, but that's a really powerful point. But uh, so I'm going to give you the CT, and then I'm just going to allow you to make a final point. Uh, so the CT, can, can there I was no... Say, can I interject? Ravi, when I listen to you, I've been watching a lot of the Premier League recently, and I just feel like I have, there's like a commentator that's like going out <laughs> over what I love your your accent. It's so, oh, I can listen to it all day. Thanks. So, so this the CT uh, showed no fracture. And uh, what what would you think about that now? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the mic to Robbie to take this home, but I um I think that's pretty good for ruling out fracture. That's what I'll say. <laughs> and then pass the mic to Robbie. Yeah, no, I completely agree, and I think you want to take advantage of other things like did the CT show an effusion there? Is there soft tissue swelling? So the CT is definitely great for looking at fracture and decently good at detecting effusions. So I think that would be the 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 key question I'd ask on the CT. Um, and if not, then I think you need another test, either an MRI or an ultrasound to guide your aspiration. So now you know that there is a problem in the shoulder and it's not the bones. Uh, what is it? Okay, so I have the I MRI. Robbie, one question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Because I know you're coming to... Robbie, you recently taught me something about like you might find crystals, but it's not crystalline disease. Can you um, just... Because I think it's such an important teaching point that I... Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's definitely true. Once a crystal has, once you've had a monoarticular arthritis or an arthritis from a crystal, the, the crystal never goes away. So it's always in the joint. So you, you can always be picking up this story where somebody had a history of gout in their shoulder, had gout, treated the gout. They have now gout crystals in their shoulder forever and ever and ever, and they get superimposed septic arthritis. And what happens is you tap it, you see the crystals and you stop. Um, but the crystals have been there for centuries. So, um, uh, as a joint ages, the probability of crystalline disease increases, but the probability of crystalline disease being an innocent bystander is also uh, something to play around with. So infections clear, but cr crystals don't. And so you have to be very careful. I think it's such a strong point. And then now if you're looking at this patient, you're like history of diabetes, Dan Minter made the point that bacteria love areas that are traumatized, like to like whether it's like, you know, um, degenerative joint disease, whether it's mitral valve prolapse, they just love it. So you take diabetes, you have trauma, and you have this patient, um, you have to rule out infection. Holy smokes, Dan Minter is here? <laughs> yeah. What's up, Dr. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's so nice to see you here. I know. I'm excited to be back. It's, it's a pleasure. I hope we see you more often. I haven't seen that hat, though. I, uh, I think it's, it's, oh, there we go. I had tip, too. I'm touched. All right, so um, I'll wrap it up with um, the MRI. So this really bowled me over. I was not expecting this, but the findings were a subdeltoid bursitis with abscess formation resulting in moderate distension and myositis of the deltoid muscle with micro abscesses uh, under the under the fibers that communicate with the with the bursa. There's also reactive edema and. Um, I think uh, moderate osteoarthritis of the AC joint. Uh, and there possibly is a evidence of septic arthritis of, or osteomyelitis as well. And uh, blood cultures came back, MSSA bacteremia. Um, absolutely. 
love this case uh, presentation, Ravi. And this is a nightmare to manage because you have a literally um, a pocket of infection that needs debrided. And based on the um, evidence of possible osteomyelitis, you can tell that this has been going on for some time, <clears throat> probably starting a week ago during his initial admission where he was complaining of discomfort. And the same way the cardiologist says time is myocardial tissue or the neurologist says time is spinal tissue, the infectious disease doctor says time is joint function. And so this is a patient that um, you start them on the antibiotics targeted towards MSSA, you call ortho to take them to the operating room and you have to debride that joint and hope for uh, recovery and um, reversibility of function. But that's my two cents. Would love to hear um, Robbie's thought before passing it to you, Robbie, to tell us what actually what happened for the patient. Well, friends, I couldn't agree more. And I know we have a staph aureus expert in the house. In fact, it's it's said that if you call these people, including Dr. Dan Minter, that they will actually do a better job than anyone in the sun and save the patient's life. Dr. Minter, what are your thoughts? Don't mess with staph. You know, staph, it, huh? it's bad news bears. I mean, you see, I put a little bit of stuff in the chat, but um, like, why might this happen now? Like this patient had a traumatic injury to, to their shoulder recently and were in the hospital, probably had some complicated stuff going on in the hospital. But you can kind of think of like, if you have inflammation from like the trauma, more blood is going to be going to that now, no longer like perfectly Teflon coated joint. So you have more blood. If you introduce bacteria going to that area, it'll just kind of hone in on that shoulder. So this is something we see a lot. Like I, I remember a couple of cases of, you know, a patient who was like walking with like a suitcase and tripped and like hurt his shoulder and then get staph bacteremia with like septic arthritis of his shoulder, like three days later. Um, so it's like a good story. And you always kind of want to know, like, why is this happening to the patient? And then exactly like you were saying, Robbie, it's like, if there's like, crystalline disease that doesn't exclude stuff because again, like abnormal shoulder is fodder for staph bacteremia to stick onto. So kind of big tenets for staph bacteremia in, in one minute are you want to know where it came from and where did it go? And why you want to know where it came from isn't necessarily just because you're curious and you're like, oh my God, yeah, now we have like the answer to the story. It's to really put like a timeline on the duration of the bacteremia. So you can say, my foot got really red and angry on Tuesday. I'm here on Thursday and your, my blood culture shows staph aureus. You can presume you're probably bacteremic for two days versus if you don't have any obvious source and you come in on Thursday and you have two out of two staph bacteremia, you could have been bacteremic for a day. You could have been bacteremic for three weeks. And that has implications into your risk sort of calculation for endocarditis. So that's kind of the main reason I always want to know, like, can we actually put a name of like, where did this come from on it? So you can put a timeline and then potentially fix whatever, you know, the source is like if it's an abscess or something. And then the, the part that infectious disease doctors get all like, you know, very, very like nitpicky about is any symptom like at all, you need to think of like, did staff stick to some other part of their body? So like they have a little bit of like creak in their neck or like their back hurts a little bit. Maybe it's the bed, but we're going to get an MRI. If the patient tells me their back hurts, like, I don't care. I'm going to push for an MRI just because then you can sort of get into the bucket of like, oh, this is complicated staph aureus bacteremia with an osteoarticular manifestation that that's going to push your treatment out, you know, closer to like six weeks for a lot of these cases. And then you also want to make sure they don't have like a septic, um, like spinal epidural abscess or something else that, you know, could impede their function going forward. The last thing I'll say, this is MSSA, so methicillin uh, susceptible staph aureus bacteremia as opposed to MRSA, like seeing it from like the, the rooftops, like MS, uh, MSSA you should treat with either cefazolin or nafcillin. Um, anything else is like no, no longer like first line therapy. So it's like, it's like the Ricky Bobby anchorman sort of thing. It's like, if you're not first, you're last. Like you wanna be on a first line regimen, you wanna be on methicillin, um, MSSA sort of directed therapies with nafcillin or cefazolin as like your first line. Yeah, I, I had two points to add. Um, um, yeah, luckily an ID case, Dan Dan is here, so the right person for, for this case. Uh, 
But uh, if you walk it back, you, you know, if you if if they had listened to the patient that hey, I'm having these sweats and I'm having these shakes before I'm leaving. I came in with an MVA. Could this be if they had listened to the patient and not attributed to his primary presentation MVA? You're banged up. You have all these sores and bruises and so on. Could this been averted and could we avoided this uh, these complications? And the second thing is he had a a lot of soft tissue injury, a lot of cuts and so on. So, Dan, could that be uh, a portal for MSSA back dream and then subsequent setup shop in the in the in the shoulder? Absolutely. Um, and then the other thing we think of in folks who get bacteremia in the hospital is to look at all their IV sites. So sometimes if they have the IV that's left in for a couple of days, um, they can get like a septic thrombophlebitis. So I try and feel along the track where their IV was, but definitely like if there's skin break, you know, that's an easy portal of entry. No, oh, this was absolutely amazing. My favorite part, my favorite part was um, Prof. Rez zeroing in on the um, on the shoulder findings on the exam and bringing it to a shoulder, and then Ravi's like um, uh, really nuanced questioning, despite knowing the diagnosis, and then the wisdom of Dr. Minter and staff. Um, I think this is an absolutely awesome case. We very rarely get to talk about a relatively common problem, shoulder pain, and a relatively common badness like MSSA back treatment. So Ravi, thank you so much for bringing this case. Yasmin, take us home, please. Of course, this was a great, um, a great case. Thank you. Again, great discussion as always. Great case, Dr. Ravi. So for the teaching points, it's gonna be as quick as I can. First of all, when we have this patient with chest pain, shoulder pain, we have to rule out fractures, dissections, or organ ruptures, especially because he had this um, history of a motor vehicle accident. Also, we touched the nematin makeup four plus two plus two, so we should get ECG and troponins. Now, we got into the shoulder pain. Is, was it to sepsis, gout, tumor? We also found this patient had uh, um, this sympathetic. Um, heat, um, how it, heat issues, and we thought about sympathetic toxicity, and we asked if this patient had any uh, alcohol use, which can also be caused by cocaine, bat cells, and MDMA, uh, running to the approach to joint pain. This is a trilogy or arthritis. And we have to rule out first fracture or infectious process. And remember that 5% of every x-ray may, may miss fracture. Now, in this patient, we could uh, make the differential diagnosis between sepsis and crystalline disease uh, because he had effusion, right? Now, in hemorrhagic effusions plus inflammation, you can take, you can think BCP or CPP, which is crystal deposition diseases. Now, we found that this patient had septic arthritis. And as a teacher Reza said, time is joint function. So um, we have to think about when we have a patient like this, debride and uh, start treatment. Now, um, risk factors for this patient were uh, diabetes mellitus. And since he had this traumatic injury, recent hospitalization, we found out that maybe it was the reason for his MSSA bacteremia. And quickly, because of this is a sad aureus, um, we have to think that it is the most common in adults with septic arthritis. And since it's uh, MSSA, we have to treat with naphthalene and acephacelin and look at all IV sites to look for thrombophlebitis. So this is all the teaching points for today. Yasmin, that was phenomenal. I, I've learned to admire you on the chat because you're so, you're a sniper with the diagnosis when it comes to all infections. Um, but I, I thank you. This teaching was extraordinary. And then Rafa, if you can one more time for people who came later, tell us what you have going on this weekend. Unless Rafa has uh, dipped out. Is Rafa still there? Oh, he's not. Um, Ravi, do you mind telling everyone what we have going on this meeting, this weekend? Oh, absolutely. Um, tomorrow we have a, a, a session uh, with Dr. Gallo, who will be dis discussing tips for personal statement for everybody that's applying for MATCH 2023. So definitely join uh, for a high yield session. Thanks.